and I are going to be meeting about five minutes of 12. So um, we're delighted that I'm so sorry to miss Lisa Gottlieb, whom I just appreciate so much and have just enjoyed hearing her talk about nonviolent communication. And we're delighted to have her here today to do that. So you're all in for a treat, Aww. with or without the DRC staff. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sally, for that warm welcome. So this is my second time here, and it was a few years back when I did the first training. Can I just see a show of hands of who was at the first training? Okay, so just a few of you. I'm glad to know that, because some of this will be a little bit of review and some of it will be new. Um, so I want to actually start right in, because this is going to be pretty interactive and we have a limited time, and there's so much I love to share about nonviolent communication. So this is really just a little peek into it. And I'm going to be leaning towards how nonviolent communication and mediation have some overlap, and also how it might be a little bit different. Um, you know, one of the things, uh, one of the main differences, I think, around mediation and nonviolent communication is that mediation, we really use compromise a lot as a way to try and come to uh, solutions and progress and agreements that people can live with. But Marshall Rosenberg, the founder of nonviolent communication, used to say about compromise, he would say, oh yeah, the solution where everyone's equally miserable. And we all, right, like where some of us are smiling and nodding because sometimes it feels like that's the best we can do. Only in nonviolent communication, the idea is that whatever the solution ends up being, it is driven by the idea that we look at shared needs and whether everyone gets exactly what they want or not, their essential human needs are respected and honored, which is a different view. Marshall Rosenberg also used to say that conflict does not happen at the level of shared human needs. It happens at the level of strategies, how we go about trying to meet our needs. Um, I believe he said something along the lines of every act of violence, every disagreement, every conflict is a tragic reflection of an unmet need. Mm -hmm. So of course we all can think in history of incredibly heinous uh, groups, organizations, and people who have done terrific, horrific harm to others. And we don't even have to look into history. We can hold that now. But what we're going to focus on today is the everyday difficulties that we have with people, the stories we hold in our head about them, um, and how to solve these everyday conflicts. You know, for the most part in our daily lives, the things that happen to us or, or the activities or engagements that we have that are difficult for us, for the most part are mostly neutral. It's the story we tell about them that creates the conflict and the disharmony and the, the wrongness and the blame. So in NBC, we work really hard to say it's not about what someone else is doing or not doing. It's what is it that's alive for me in the moment. And by alive, I mean what are the feelings I'm having and what are my universal human needs. And from that point, I have more creative energy to figure out strategies. Okay, that was a lot of talking. So I'm going to ask you to turn to your neighbor and uh, maybe turn to someone you, you don't know, if that's possible. But if you, you kind of all know each other, so it's fine. But listen to my instructions, please, and then I'll, 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 I'll tell you, I'll invite you to, to, ask, uh, to answer this question. Um, I love this negotiation of <laughs> trying to, to fulfill the request I'm making. Would you ask the person with whom you're sitting, what is it you want to take away from this barely hour and a half we have together? Something measurable. And you'll have about a minute to share, and then the other person will have about a minute to share. I'll ring the chimes in between when that one minute happens, so you'll know, and then I'll ring the chimes again when it's time to stop. So go ahead and start. All right. Hi. Um, okay. Other person, take a turn to share, please. 
Okay, you may not be com complete with everything you wanted to share, but I'll ask you to bring your attention back. I'd like to hear from three people in about 30 seconds what you shared out. And when I call on you, would you say your name and what organization you're, you're with? So three people. Who would like to start? Yes. You really spoke to me when you said it's the story that we tell ourselves about the issue and, and that it's really what is alive for me. So I just recently met up with a friend. Um, I had apparently hurt her feelings a year ago and she had distance and we finally spoke. And really at the root of it was just a miscommunication, but she had been telling herself this story, right? And that's what was alive for her was, you know, she had felt that I didn't need a need. So we were able to clear it up. So that rang true in my personal life. So you connected with that right Instantly. away. Yeah, and tell me your name? Stephanie. Stephanie. All right, thank you. Yeah, so this is an example of how a simple misunderstanding can be solved by some open communication. Um, I'd like to hear from this next person. Would you raise your hand to share out? <laughs> you know, there's no pressure, and sometimes when people don't volunteer right away, it's often because there's some concern about if what they say will, will land easily with other people or if they'll be held with care. Um, it, it, it's a, to me, it's a courageous thing to speak out in a group. Um, yes, Joan. Well, I'm Joan, and I was inspired by what Kathy said to me. How was I? Well, hold on a second. I'm going to interrupt you. And I'm going to interrupt with a lot of care and concern. And at the same time, because we have such a limited amount of time, I'm torn. Because I want to hear from everyone, and our stories are so important. And I want to move into content. So, Joan, may I ask a request of you? Can you say in about 30 seconds something that was meaningful for you? And share that out with the group? OK. To be able to, when I'm angry at someone, to be able to talk about what is bothering me in our relationship without getting angry at them. Okay. So this idea of, of um, thank you, Joan. And actually, I want to stay with this just for a moment and check in with you. You know, I interrupted both of you. And interrupting is considered rude in our culture. And yet, at the same time, how many times are you in a conversation with someone and you start to lose energy and you start to lose interest? And this idea of, is there a way to interrupt with care so that um, you can really connect with someone? Now, Joan and I have a relationship, so I trusted there was enough bank between us for me to do that. But Joan, can I check in with you and say, ask you, was that all right that I interrupted you? Sure, it was fine. OK, great. I feel some relief about that, and it, it really helps me stay connected. So no, thank you. Care. I do, yeah. Thank you for seeing that. Um, you know, one of the hardest things is when we're angry, how to negotiate with someone else. And in NVC, there is room for every feeling from rage and infuriation and despair and hopelessness to help us figure out what it is we want more of. So I'm going to actually move on. And if you turn to the first page of your packet, it should be the universal wheel of human needs. Now, of course, it's not comprehensive, but it's a start. One of the differences between therapy and nonviolent communication is in therapy, we're often encouraged to talk about our feelings, to touch into our feelings, to stay with our feelings. But for many of us, that puts us into a rabbit hole of simply rumination and despair and hopelessness, especially with people who struggle with depression or anxiety. In NBC, we stay with the feelings long enough to self-connect, and then we move into the needs. Because then we have agency. Then we can create plans and strategies that hold ourselves with care and hold other people with care. So I want to ask you another question. And I'd like you to answer in popcorn style. Um, and the question is, I'd like you to answer this. What would you like more of in this world to make the world a better place? So. I'd like more of blank in this world. Okay, so think about it for a second, and then if you'll holler it out, and, and just track that I'm writing, so go ahead. Who's? Kindness. Kindness. Peace. 
Empathy. Hang on, I'm going to get another marker. Markers. Yep, markers is a strategy for communication. Empathy, what else? Care. Care? Care. Respect. Respect. And when we have respect, what do we have more of? Appreciation. Appreciation. Worth. What else? Understanding. And when we have more understanding with someone, what do we get more of? Trust. Trust. And when we have more trust with someone, what do we have more of? Hope. Hope. Did I hear love? Yes. About time. <laughs> logic. Logic. If we have more logic in the world, what will we have more of? Understanding. Understanding. Yeah, which is already here. And yeah. if you take less personal offense. So in order to take less personal offense, what you what might you want more of? Humanism. Humanity. Humanity. So let's see, humanity. Okay, let's come up with some other words to come to talk about when we see each other with humanity, what do we have more of? Connection. Thank you. Connection. Many of these lead back to connection. All right. So, in nonviolent communication, these are considered universal human needs. I may disagree with you about how to find understanding or what peace will look like. On the strategy level, we may have big differences about that. But if you ask any human on the planet, is kindness important to you? 99% of the time, they will say yes unless they are so under-resourced and so traumatized that the idea of kindness is frightening to them. But again, we're talking about in general. We'll always be able to find exceptions to things I'm sharing, but I'm asking you to hold this with a slightly different view, to imagine what it's like that even people who vehemently disagree with your politics, your view of... Uh, hot button topics like abortion or immigration or any number of things that when we only see each other for where we disagree we dehumanize each other and when we dehumanize each other everyone different from us becomes the other and that otherness and that dehumanization creates terrible injuries and problems so create a little bit more room on the board. How do we get to this point where we're able to begin to manage our own anxiety or overstimulation or triggering to begin to think about the needs of someone else and where we might overlap? And the way to do that is through empathy. Now, in order for me to be able to be empathetic for someone else, I have to have empathy bank myself. I can't possibly offer empathy to someone else if I'm depleted. And honestly, most people in our culture today are heavily depleted in the empathy department. We long to be seen and received. We long to be seen for our intentions, for our efforts, for our humanity. So we use empathy as a way to first self-connect and then connect with others. So I want to do an activity um, that I'm going to need some volunteers. It's a low-demand ask I'm making. Um, first, I'd like someone to volunteer who could share a story in about 30 seconds about something that was upsetting to them in real life. Now, I want something that on the reactivity scale, the emotional reactivity scale, if zero is eh, it's nothing, and 10 is I lost my damn mind, I want a three or a four. I want it to have some meaning, but this is a demo we're going to do, and so I need something somewhat containable. So think for a moment, and if you've got a story that can be briefly shared, that we can work with, I'd really appreciate it. 
Uh, and then we'll, I can give you a little more information for some predictability and reliability, and that is that we'll practice what empathy isn't, and then we'll give you some empathy. So you get free empathy, which really, it's like gold, I think. Um, so does anyone have, it could be someone, that someone cut you off in traffic. It can be that you had an argument with a coworker. It could be a misunderstanding of some sort. I've got a laptop. Okay. <laughs> and your name is I'm Brian. Brian. Brian, would you be willing to come up? Then we can all hear better and... Okay, so you, why don't you sit here? And now I need some volunteers who are going to be willing to make comments to Brian after he shares his story. So it's a pretty simple request. They're written down. Would you be willing? Sure. Of course you can say no, but if you really want to do it, raise your hand. This is where the, the amateur actors and actresses who like to speak up like to do it. I've got a few more. Great, thank you. You just have to, would you like to? Great, thank you. Thank you. I've got a few more. Oh, great, thank you. Oh, great, thank you. Okay, I'm going to start to demonstrate, then we'll start here and we'll work away around. First, Brian's going to share his story in about 30 seconds, and then you, those of you who have cards, will read your card and make it so that it fits his scenario. Those of you who didn't volunteer, you can follow along in your packet under the page that says Empathy Blockers. Okay, so first, Brian, you may share in about 30 seconds your story. Okay. Uh, I had my relatively new Honda Pilot parked in a parking spot, had lunch at the Chipotle over here on Washtenaw, got in my car to back out to leave, looked on both sides, looked in that little camera, and started backing my car up and backed into somebody. Oh, okay. Who had, I, I don't know where they came, I really don't, do not know where they came Okay. All right. Um, you seem pretty relaxed about it. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. But, okay, so. It happened two weeks ago. Okay, it happened two weeks ago. So, let's imagine maybe that in the moment it was somewhat upsetting and that Brian might have even been complaining about it, and I hold complaining with a very broad definition of that word. So, I'm going to start and then we'll go around. Well, Brian, now you know how I felt when that same thing happened to me. Let me tell you all about it in case you forgot. <laughs> Go ahead. I don't think it's that bad. I'm sure you're imagining the worst. It's probably just fine. Okay. Well, you guys are there. Oh, okay. Oh, I meant to tell you, when you wait to respond until everyone's oh, yeah. dead, <laughs> for some people that's really difficult, so I, I, I'm regretting I didn't mention that. Um, who's next? Who's got the next one? Yes, go ahead. Oh, you think that's bad? Let me tell you about that, the time that happened to me. Only my situation was so much worse. I can't okay. believe how terrible it was. Okay, thank you. <laughs> who's next? And please speak up so we can all hear you. I'm so sorry for you. I feel really bad for you. I'm so sorry for what you were going through. For you, I really feel upset hearing what happened. Okay, thank you. Next. Uh, listen, everything happens for a reason, and the universe is watching out for you. I'm certain it will work out, and you will learn something. Thank you. Who's next? Hey, I heard the best joke. Let me tell you about it, and I'm sure you will feel better after this. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, here's what you have to do. Um, I assume you got their email. Uh, so send them an email, tell them exactly what you want, and don't take no for an answer because you were in the right. Thank you. That's awful. I know just what you mean. What a jerk. That person doesn't have a clue about anything. Okay. <coughs> Brian, you're being overreactive. It's just so ridiculous. <laughs> this is just so silly. You're being silly. Okay. All right. So, I, you know, I heard some laughing, maybe a little bit of discomfort. Brian, how is it for you to receive that? Well, I heard some of this. Yeah. I mean, everybody, yes. yeah, I yeah. heard something. Yeah, and here's the thing. There is nothing inherently wrong with any of these responses. And many of us, you may find yourself thinking, oh, I say that all the time to people, or that's one of my go-to responses. That's fine. 
It's not empathy, though. Even the ones that I feel so bad for you, I'm so sorry this happened, I, it's just awful for me to think about. That's not empathy, that's sympathy. That's me taking the spotlight and sharing what it's like for me to hear his story. And again, sympathy is sometimes just fine. But I want to be very careful about the difference. Because in order to have empathy, it means we settle and soothe ourselves long enough to be completely present for what's going on with Brian. Empathy means I'm resourced enough in the moment to put aside my own reactivity, my own anxiety, my own worries, long enough to simply hold a space for another person. I'm curious, in mediation and other situations, how many times have you noticed your own anxiety spike when two people are arguing or disagreeing, and you have an urge to jump in and solve a problem, to reduce your own anxiety? I'm going to raise my hand. This is really common. And part of what creates more room for creativity and more room for problem solving is actually to simply hold a space for other people's experience. The other thing is we never have to agree with another person to offer them empathy. So we're going to now do another, well, let me just ask, can I hear from two people what this was like for you to do this? What was your experience of reading something that might have left you uncomfortable or that you didn't connect with or that you noticed, oh, I do this and maybe I don't, maybe I want to be more conscious about when and if I do it. Uh, yes, Huda. It, for me, it's creating, it's making me look at the blockers I have inside that keeps me from doing that. Yes, okay, so more awareness. More awareness. Uh, of choice about how you want to respond yeah. when you respond. And yep. one of them is fear. I have fear. Yeah. And, and the fear comes from, do you have a sense of what the fear comes from? Yeah. Would you share? Uh, childhood experiences, war. Yes. Or, in war. Yes. All this comes up. Yes. So for those of us who have a history of either neglect or trauma or simply painful things that have happened, little things in the here and now can stimulate that fear and then we tend to respond out of fear or anxiety. It's very common. We all have these experiences. Thank you for sharing it. It's a vulnerable thing to share. And I, my guess is, would you raise your hand if you relate to that and resonate in some way to show Huda that she's not the only one? Yeah, thank you. Um, we're going to do the next part now. And this is part of an essential quality of nonviolent communication. And again, I'm going to need some volunteers. I'm going to hand out some cards. This side of the room I'm going to give feeling cards to that have feeling words. This side of the room I'm going to give needs cards, which are more about what someone might need. Okay, so I have a lot of cards. Would you raise your hand if you're willing to take a stack and play along? Okay, so I'll come, I'm going to do feelings first. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you, Pink. Back to you. Got two more here. Uh, Joan, you're going to be on the neat side. And either of you willing? Or over here? You get to say no. I said yes. Oh, great. Okay. I don't want to pressure people who aren't for doing it, but I've got one more set. Thank you, April. Okay, needs. Let's see. I saw. And uh, Michigan, did you want? Okay. All right. So. I'm going to have Brian tell his story again. And if you want to use just a little bit more emotion just for the sake of demo, that would be fine. And if you're not comfortable with that, it won't be demo. It'll be it's what it was. That's fine. You, you do you. So go ahead, 30 seconds, tell the story. So I was in this parking lot. I looked both ways at the mirrors that looked in that little camera. And I looked next to me, and there was a guy who was going to pull out. And he was waiting to pull out. And I'm wondering why he's not pulling out. And I look again. And then I back up. And I back into this car. And I get out of my car. And I come behind my car. And I see I've dented the back end of my car. And I've dented the back uh, 
passenger door of the driver's side of this other car, and this woman gets out and starts yelling at me. So I, I said to her, look, I don't know where you came from, and she starts saying, what are we going to do about this? What are you going to do? I need your driver's license. So I'm not giving her my driver's license. The woman's nuts. <laughs> so, so we just sat there for a while. I said, ma'am, why don't you move your car so this guy can get out? She goes, no, I'm calling the police. I'm not moving anything. So everybody just had to sit there while this woman, she called her husband, talked to him for 10 minutes or something, yelled <laughs> at him because she had to go get the kids someplace. I mean, this is all going on, I'm sitting there. And finally she said, who, who has to get out? So I said, that guy with this car running next to me. So finally she moved the car and let this guy get out. And then I waited around for a while, I gave her my name and phone number, and I drove away. Okay. Thank you, Brian. All right, I'm going to demonstrate what happens next, because I have an extra set of feelings and needs cards. So I'm going to look through my feelings cards first. All my, all the beginning ones are all these happy, neat, happy feelings that are like, mm, I don't think he felt that way about it. Oh, let's try this one. All right. So I'm going to just pick one, and what I'm going to do is I'm just going to approach Brian and offer him a feeling guess. It's going to be an inquiry, not a statement, not um, it's going to be simply a, an inquiry. And Brian, again, I'm not going to I'm going to ask you not to respond. I'm just going to set it down. So, Brian, I wonder if one of the things you felt was surprised, and then I'm going to. And I wonder if one of the needs you had in the situation was, um, hmm, oh, maybe shared reality. Okay, so what I said to him was, Brian, I wonder if you're feeling this, and then the needs cards, because you wanted more of this, or you needed this, or you would have preferred this. That's the language. You don't need to add ballast for why you're putting these down. You don't need to explain or analyze. You're simply following this format of might you have been feeling this or were you feeling this because you wanted more of this or this is more important, this is important to you, okay? So those of you who have the feelings cards, would you pick one card that you think will match? This is more like that. This is more like that. Yeah, we have feelings. Oh, jeez. Okay. I'm showing my human side. No, it's okay. You know, my other set, my other set, the colors are backwards. And so I wasn't tracking it. So thank you for pointing that out. So those of you who have the feelings yeah. cards over here, yeah. would you pick one card and be willing to come around and just simply ask him and put it on the floor were you feeling this? Mm -hmm. And if you don't want to stand up and come around, I can do it for you, but if you're willing, I think it's more powerful. You just want me to walk. I just want you to be open, but not say anything. So feelings are over here. Um, Brian, I wondered if you felt shocked. Okay, and then just put it down right by the feelings. Thank you, Shannon. Yep. And go ahead. All right, I was wondering if you were feeling irritated. Great, and it'll go on this side. Okay. Thank you. I wonder if you were feeling troubled. Thank you. Anyone else have other feelings, or those of you who have the feelings cards, any other ones that seem accurate that you might want to come and share again? Yeah, two more. Okay. If you've got a couple, you can come bring them up. I was wondering if you were feeling stressed and frustrated. Great. Thank you. Okay, those of you with the needs cards, same thing. If you're open to coming up and actually asking him directly and placing it down, that's fine. If not, I can, I can do it for you. I wonder if you felt it needs to be seen. Okay, and we'll put that right over here. I wondered if you felt a need to be reassured. Thank you. I wondered if you felt a need for protection. Protection, okay, thank you. I wonder if you wanted your intentions 
to be seen for your intentions. Great. Thank you. Any other ones? Okay, this is a good start. So, Brian, what I'd like you to do is look at these cards, at the feelings, and pick one or two that seem like they might have captured how you were feeling. And if there's more than two, that's fine. If, you, if none of these resonate with you, that's okay, too. But go ahead and look and see, and then I'll, I'll pick them up for you. You can tell me what ones. Irritated and frustrated. Irritated and frustrated. Okay. And then... Let's look for a minute about maybe what you would have wanted more of. Any of these? Well, I wanted to literally be seen by this woman. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure what that, that, that's what that is. I like that. Let's, let's yeah. give you that I mean, one. What the hell? Yes. Yeah. Oh. All right. So without using your cards and maybe just looking at your needs sheet, your wheel of needs, Will anyone take a moment and look at your wheel of needs and holler out? Well, ask Brian. Were you needing more of this? Were you needing more respect? More respect. Okay. Because you were talking to her, you said she and, yelled at you. Right. So thank you, and you don't have to respond yet, oh. but I'm tracking respect. That's okay. fine. Um, Brian, I wonder if you needed more understanding. Mm -hmm. Understanding, respect. Let's hear one more. Space. Space. And when you, yeah, like physical space? Yeah. I like that kind of, it's a pun. More space from this woman who was all up in his grill and more physical space to back out his car with ease and efficiency and effectiveness. Yeah? Okay. So let me just check in first with you, Brian, and see was there a difference for you in this second round? of what we call empathy guesses than the first round, which we call empathy blockers. Yeah, m most definitely the descriptors of how I felt rather than other people telling me it's just going to be fine, this is God's will, or everything works out well, yes. Yeah, okay. So the idea of the focus being on Brian and what was going on That's for him idea. in that moment lands better, it tends to resonate better with people because they feel seen and understood and received and cared for. Now, there's a reason that I didn't ask Brian to say yes or no when people brought up their cards and their guesses. Do you know why that might be? Why I had him just wait quietly? What, what might be a guess? to affect their decision about what they wanted to share. Yes, to give them room to share. Without anticipating what my needs were. Just to ask what my needs are rather than try to uh, massage it to say what I want to hear. So that's actually, I really, I'm really, I like that. It's not what I was necessarily thinking about, but I can see that what you're saying is you wanted to give people a lot of space to both practice connecting and have some uh, room to make a guess without immediately being judged or evaluated. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm going with this. Because, you know, we live in a culture where we're constantly being evaluated. Are we doing it right or are we doing it wrong? And here's the thing with empathy guesses that I really want to stress that no matter what else you take out with you today, I really want you to remember this. There is no such thing as a wrong empathy guess. If it resonates with the person, that's wonderful. They have a sense of connection and they, they um, get some understanding and it's a lovely thing. But if you make a guess and it's not anything about what the person was feeling or needing, guess what they still receive from you? The gift of your attention, the gift of your intention, your time and energy that you actually considered what was important to someone else. Mm -hmm. Sometimes someone might say, no, it's not that I needed protection, but you know, I, I really did need more um, efficiency. The 
gift of silent empathy, the gift of an empathetic guess that comes from the heart and not from some pressure to be good or right or be the best empathy giver ever, which is how I started when I, I like I decided, oh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna just be so good at giving empathy. And half the time I completely missed what was going on in the emotional realm because I was so up in my head trying to be good. And one of my mentors said to me, you never have to worry about tracking someone's story or keeping track of the details because if you miss it the first time, they'll bring it up again until you get it. Okay, Brian, a uh, round of applause for you. Um, and actually, before, before you leave, can I ask to hear from a couple of people what this was like to offer these empathy guesses? Was it comfortable? Did it feel vulnerable? Were you feeling like some tension around being judged or wanting to do a good job? Hear from a couple people, please. I just put myself in his shoes and thought, how would I feel? So yeah. it was pretty easier. I was like, I'd be frustrated and irritated. Yes. This is the key. This is what empathy really is. Can I put myself, can I imagine myself in someone else's place? What would my experience be? And then share that. Now, sometimes people have experiences that we have no connection with. We can't even imagine it. So we sit with it and we hold a presence for it. And then we tentatively ask, gee, I, I'm curious. Was this really uncomfortable? Was this scary? And then we connect with the needs. And oftentimes the need that is longing to be filled is the opposite of the feeling. So if I'm really uncomfortable, what do I want more of? Comfort. 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 Mm -hmm. If I'm... Um, uh, if I'm really unhappy, what might I want more of? Happiness. Yeah, exactly. Brian, you can sit down. Thank you so much. All right, so let me, oh, thanks. I like that collaboration. All right, so any questions about this part of empathy? Yes, go ahead. Just from my own personal experience, I just want to point out how important it would be for me in the receiving seat for the empathy guesses to be real questions, not come across as, well, I assume you're feeling blah, blah. Yeah. Or, mm -hmm. So yeah. did everyone hear, Craig, that what he's saying is the value of a heartfelt inquiry, a heartfelt curiosity, and asking as a, as a heartfelt question is very different than someone saying, well, you must have felt this, or I can only, I, I, of, of course you felt this. What does that feel like? Disconnected. Disconnected? I don't like someone else up in my head. And I certainly don't like anyone telling me how it is for me. I'm very sensitive to that these days. Someone, someone telling me how my experience is, telling me how I'm feeling or what I'm needing. I immediately shut down because my need for choice and autonomy are so strong that even if they're accurate, I'm going to reject it. Sometimes at my own expense. Just a quick question, Lisa, yes. just to that point. So can you give us, I'm a practical thinker, can you yes. give us, uh, can you show us a couple ways you would say it to Brian? Yes. Um, you mean in, in the way that... Uh, like how should someone phrase those questions as to point? So you know, to the formal, point? thank you for that question. Because this is a workshop setting, I'm using very formal language, the formal language of NBC. Are you feeling this because you're needing this? The tendency is to add on to our stories about it. Are you feeling frustrated because you really didn't like that you were late to your next meeting? And are you needing um, more ease because, you know, life is stressful? And that starts to analyze and move away from connection. It's very easy to do because we want to have ballast for our case. But simply stating... Are you feeling this because you're needing this? Now, if I go home and I say to my teenage child, I don't have a teenage child, but when I did, um, gee, it seems like you had a hard day. I'm wondering if you're feeling frustrated and, um, and, and um, 
exhausted and what you're really longing for is more ease and more relaxation and more understanding, my kid's going to look at me and go, what happened to you? Like, who, why are you being a therapist with me? Which I got a lot from my kids anyway. <laughs> it's not natural language. But because this is a setting where we're practicing, I'm using this formal language to help, it, help with understanding. The more natural language you can use, the better. In work settings, I drop the word feeling altogether. And I might just say, wow, that must, was that frustrating for you? Or, wow, that, I can imagine that, that would be frustrating, was it? Or, um, and instead of saying needs, like with a close friend, I might say, wow, I bet your heart was really longing for this. Or I wonder, was your heart longing for more understanding? If I said that at work, I'd probably be like charged with sexual harassment. <laughs> but instead, I can say, you know, it sounds like um, collaboration is really important to you. Or I wonder if what you value the most about this is some shared, shared understanding with people. You can hear the difference, yeah? Can you hear the subtle difference? Drop the word feeling and just name it. And instead of using needs, talk about value or importance or um, something someone wants. It lessens the therapeutic formality, what some people call the robotic aspect of MBC. So I say this because if you immediately go home and start trying this, people are going to look at you like, what happened to you? And then you're going to think MBC doesn't work. It works. It has to be authentic. It has to come from the heart. And natural language that matches the situation is going to work better. If I'm talking to kids, I'm going to match their tone and their language. If I'm in a formal setting, I'm going to be more formal. If I'm with my friends who I'm very close with, I might use more vulnerable or intimate language. So that's all I'm going to say about that now. But we, with more study of NBC, we delve into that much, much more deeply. Yes, question. Are you going to talk more about silent empathy? Oh, sure. I can talk for a minute about silent empathy. Hmm. I didn't talk about it, actually. I moved away from the talking and the intellectual, and I dropped into my body. And it took me a moment to transition. I took a deep breath, and I exhaled, and I felt my feet on the floor. I self-connected, relaxed for a moment, and then I looked at you in a gentle, open way. My arms and my legs are relaxed and I'm facing you directly. I believe that silent empathy is one of the most powerful tools we have because it takes intention and attention and I have to be self-soothed enough to do it. I have to be present for another person. It's very powerful because most people simply want to be heard and received and accepted. They don't need advice. They don't need you to steal their thunder or give them platitudes or tell them a joke. They simply want to be received. Is that, is that helpful? Yeah, I mean, I think in mediation, we do a lot of silent empathy, and I often wonder if it's enough. I think it's a start. Mm -hmm. The fact is, empathy is a strategy. It's a strategy for connection and for shared reality and for a person feeling valued. But if all we do is empathy, we will never accomplish anything. We'll just sit there and say, wow, it must have been so difficult, you, and you must have been so angry. And what you really wanted is understanding. Or, gee, when your neighbor did this, I can only imagine how furious you were. And what you'd really like is more respect. Well, we can only do that for so long. But we do it in order for someone to settle and feel understood and cared for. So that leads me into our next part, which is self-expression. Now, we call it in NBC honest self-expression. And by honest, I don't mean you go up to say someone and 
you go up to someone and you say, you know what? I'm just going to be honest with you. You're a jerk. I mean, you can, but what happens? Defensiveness, shutting down. You, go ahead. Conflict. Conflict. The person says, oh, yeah, well, I think you're a jerk, too. And then you're off to the races. So instead, um, instead, once we've addressed some empathy for ourselves and other people, we actually want to move forward into what it is we want and how to make requests and how to ask for what we want. And one way to do that is to make a very clear observation about something that doesn't stimulate defensiveness. Um, and this is where our storylines, the way the stories we make about each other can really get in the way. I'm going to give you a brief example. Um, where I work at WISD, there's parking spaces near the building for special ed providers like me, because I'm a school social worker, so I can pull into a parking space, run in, do my thing, and go on to my next setting. There's maybe, I don't know, eight or nine of these spaces. And what would happen is I'd come to work in the morning, and the spaces would be full of parents dropping off their kids at Honey Creek School, because it was super convenient for them to park there and just run across the road. And every morning, I'd just be incensed. I'd be like, can't these parents read the signs? What's the matter with them? They're so inconsiderate. All they're thinking about is themselves. Don't they care about our hardworking service providers? This went on for weeks, I'm embarrassed to say. Until one day, <laughs> there was a space open near the end, and I pulled in, and the sign was actually for parent drop-off. <laughs> Half of them were for service providers like me, but the other half were actually for parents to drop off their children because it was very convenient. So if someone had a four or five year old and a baby or a toddler, it made their life easier. Can you imagine my embarrassment? And also my relief that I never called out a parent about it. <laughs> As I was telling this story, and I was talking about my outrage, could you resonate with it? It's like, oh, that's so unfair. That's, that's not right. Then when you hear what the actual reality is, what happens? It's that, sort of that feeling of like, oh, embarrassment. embarrassment. Relief that I wasn't my usual impulsive self who gets on a rant about something and then ends up being like, oh dear. Mm -hmm. So, you know, often the way we, and, and the example you had about this misunderstanding, mm -hmm. most of the time there's a misunderstanding. The more we can come up with a clear observation about something that's based in fact, the better the chance we have of connecting with another person. In order to get to that, I might have to do a lot of self-empathy. I might have to really pay attention to what I'm so incensed about and then see, well, what is it I want more of? Move from blame, wrongness, punishment about someone else and more about, well, what can I do? What will give me more agency? Now, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying let go of accountability and responsibility. I absolutely want to hold people accountable and responsible for things they do that might hurt another person, hurt themselves, create um, any sort of situation of conflict or difficulty or injury. But that's different for making them a bad person because of the choices they make. I think you understand this because you work with people. You get how this works. So coming up with a clear observation is much easier for someone else to receive us. And I use language like, I'm remembering that it happened this way. Not, this is what happened. But here's my memory of it, because we all know memory is fallible, yeah? Here's how, I'm, here's how I'm remembering it. Maybe you're holding it in a different way. Let me know. It takes humility to do that, right? To, to realize, like, oh, I really, I, I had this whole judgment going about these parents parking in this spot that was mine. Couldn't have been more um, misunderstanding of the situation. 
So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to help us practice this in an easy way with gratitude grants. So here's the thing about gratitude that you may know already, that gratitude actually changes brain function. Can I pass like, you out over? We pass it out. Thank you. Um, that when we practice gratitude, the centers in the brain that have to do with dopamine light up. In the same way they light up when we use drugs, illicit drugs, recreational drugs, when we eat chocolate or have an alcoholic drink or see our beloved or someone we might have a crush on, it makes us feel good. Gratitude does the same thing. It doesn't differentiate between what it is that's stimulating it. Here's the other thing. If I have a gratitude practice and I decide, well, I'm going to, did everyone get one? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm going to spend a few minutes and think about what I'm grateful for. And in that moment, I'm so frustrated or disconnected, I can't think of anything. Guess what? Those dopamine centers still light up in my brain. Now, if I have a gratitude and I share it with someone else, let's say I tell you something about something I'm grateful about, that the woods were so beautiful this morning when I was walking my dog, and I had this sense of connection with nature. Dopamine lights up in her brain, too. Keep talking to me. Right. <laughs> and typically what happens is everyone listening gets a hit of dopamine as well. So practicing gratitude is a big part of nonviolent communication. It reduces resentment and blame. It connects us with the beauty in our world. And it gives us hope at times when we feel hopeless. So writing a few gratitudes every day having a gratitude practice that involves intentionally thinking about a few things. Having a gratitude buddy where we text a friend and say, here's what I'm grateful about. Tell me what you're grateful about today. And mix it up so that you don't get bored with it. So it doesn't just become one more thing you're doing. So what I'd like you to do now is to take your gratitude gram, and I'm going to have you use the format that we often use in nonviolent community communication, which is make an observation, a very clear, specific thing that someone said or did. You know, um, when you did the dishes last night without me having to ask, there's an observation. I felt grateful and delighted and relieved because I was tired and it really met my needs for ease and relaxation, and to be cared for. It's very simple. The more specific the observation, the easier it is to connect with the feelings and needs around it. So take a moment, think of something very specific that someone said or did, and write them a gratitude gram. It can be someone you work with, it can be someone uh, in your home life, someone in the community, but take a couple minutes to write it out. And you can leave the request at the bottom alone for now. Because we'll talk about requests in a minute. Raise your hand if you need more time, please. OK, great. So I'm wondering if anyone is willing to share their gratitude out loud so that the group can have an experience of um, both a dopamine uh, flash, which is lovely, but also for some connection. Uh, yes, and tell me your name? Jennifer. Jennifer, yeah, and if you'll just speak up so everyone can hear you. Okay, I'll do my best. Is it someone in the room or is it someone outside? It is not. So okay. That's why it's, yeah. So this is my cousin. Great. And uh, she lives in Atlanta. Okay. And she came up to visit me. And, uh, which. She left behind her kids and all the other family and said, I just want to see you. So that made me feel happy and delighted and valued and honored that she took the time out to do that. And that made me um, really appreciative that she trusted me to come and share that and kind of work that through. And I actually already, already wrote her a letter that basically says this, so I can't yeah. tell you what her response is. Okay. Anyhow, so Thank you so much yeah. for sharing that. Would you be willing to share it again as if your cousin is here in the room? 
and as if you're speaking to your cousin okay. without an explanation which was helpful for us to get the context but I'd like this to go even more more deeply and, and maybe I can represent your cousin for you sure. and you can speak directly to me and I'm gonna hold that space for you would you be willing sure great thank you uh, I am so excited that you drove all the way up here to see me and that you just came by yourself so that we can have this special time together and uh, I hope uh, I hope I can help you work through what you're struggling with um, but I love you and I'm just I feel so honored and so blessed that you're in my life thank you for sharing that thank you oh. when is it Jennifer Yes. I'm sorry. When Jennifer shared directly to me, what happened? Was it different than when she explained the situation? Did you connect with her and with possibly how it might be for her cousin to receive that kind of message? To me, it's a really beautiful thing. And I want to point out, Jennifer, that your languaging was very natural. That's how I experienced it. It wasn't when, um, what's your cousin's name? Leanne. Leanne. Leanne, when you came to visit me, um, uh, I felt grateful and um, it met my needs for being honored and respected. <laughs> Instead, Jennifer used this sort of natural language that got us in touch with feeling, I believe you said honored and blessed. Yeah. And that there was some delight in there. I want to point this out because it's less about the words and it's less about following a specific um, framework. Thank you. <laughs> hate it when that happens. Framework or protocol. And instead, it came from Jennifer's heart. First, the observation, very specific. Then, what came up for her about it? And then, these needs that were met. So, it's a beautiful thing for ourselves and for other people when we share gratitude, and I highly recommend it as a daily practice. It has been proven to reduce uh, resentments. You know, there's a, there's a Buddhist saying that, uh, that, that goes something like, when we pick up a hot coal to throw at someone else, who gets burned? Yeah. Yeah, I think that I think in the 12-step community they say resentment is like drinking rat poison and waiting for the other person to get sick. <laughs> because it's poison. It's 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 poison to our system. Yeah. Could I ask someone else to read another one? Uh, yes, and you are April. Yeah, April, please. And first I have to be confessional. I was thinking of a young woman in my spiritual community that I've had sort of a maternal relationship with and who has been publicly critical of me over the last several months and of course totally unwarranted. Um, <laughs> but, of course. But what I'm being confessional about is that my first thought was, oh good, if I do that, she's going to feel really bad. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So let me stop before you read yeah. it. This is a very vulnerable thing to share, and I really want to thank you for naming this. It can be really confusing when our needs to be seen and respected get mixed up with our strategies. And anytime we mix up our strategies with our needs, bad things happen. Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a, I'm gonna give you a really pro tip in a minute about how to know when something's a need and how to know when it's a strategy, so that you're, you have an easier time figuring out what needs are really wanting to be met, and what are strategies to try and reduce our anxiety or make us feel better in the moment at someone else's expense. Yeah. So I appreciate you naming that, April. And would you read your gratitude gram? And would you read it to me as if I am this person with whom you'd like to? Share some sure. gratitude? Okay. What, what I could with integrity say to her yes. is um, when I remember that you offered to stay at my house with me last year when I was very sick with pneumonia, I want you to know that I felt grateful, supported, and safer by your presence uh, because I value your, your presence in my life. Thank you. 
what I think is incredibly valuable in addition to April sharing this was that she started out by saying, I don't know if everyone heard, she said, this is what I can authentically share. And unless it's authentic, it will not land. It will sound patronizing and cloying, and people will resent it. They'll feel like there's some manipulation going on. People are really good at knowing when my words don't match what's going on inside of me. And then trust is diminished. So the fact that you came up with one thing that you could really feel gratitude about. Now, I want to point out that you, April, actually did something that I think is advanced NVC. And that is at the end, you said, because I value you. Any time we can connect with a person, even if we're in a difficult conversation, find something we actually really value about them and say, listen, I'd really like to have a conversation with you and it might be awkward or difficult, only I value our relationship enough where I'm willing to take that chance and I wonder if you would be willing to. Inviting someone into a conversation, inviting them even if it's for gratitude because some people don't, they have a hard time receiving gratitude. They want to deflect it, they are uncomfortable, it feels too vulnerable. So again, hey, you know, last week, um, I realized I was appreciating something about you and I wonder, could I share with you what I'm grateful about? Most people will say, you want to tell me something that you appreciate about me? Sure. It usually feels really good. So that invitation is, is key. Then for you to name very specifically something that, that was measurably helpful to you. You were ill and she come and stayed with you and you were sense of the needs that were met for care and attention, maybe some safety, that it increased her value to you. Even in the midst of these other things going on, of her criticism of you or your difficult relationship, it gives you more bandwidth. It gives you more resources to hold her with care, to maybe even be curious about what's going on with her that she would criticize April. Maybe she's feeling insecure or under-resourced. Maybe what she's really needing is more support and more care and more understanding. I know when I have enough self-empathy to begin to offer empathy to someone else, when I have enough bandwidth to be curious about someone else's experience, if I can't get there, I'm not ready. Then I need to give myself empathy and to do that it's the same thing instead of asking someone else what are you feeling and what are you needing I say to myself well what am I feeling right now oh my stomach hurts and my jaw is tight and and I notice I have this kind of metallic taste in my mouth there's some anxiety going on I must be feeling a little anxious or fearful I'm really uncomfortable oh giving myself some room for that vulnerability long enough to really hold that with care. And then, well, what is it I want? Well, I want some relief from this discomfort. I want a sense of safety and to be seen for who I am. You know, most of us really want to be seen for our intentions, and instead we're often misunderstood, at least I am. This is a tender need for me, the need to, be, to matter and belong and to be seen for my efforts. So thank you, thank you for that, April. Um, okay, I want to move along because we only have 20 minutes left. Also, I have extra gratitude grams, so if you want to take one home with you when we're done, just come up and grab one. Um, I highly recommend doing gratitude on a regular basis. Let's look at requests for a minute. At the bottom of the gratitude gram, there's a question, how is this for you to hear? There are two connecting requests in NBC. One is, hey, can you tell me what you heard me say? Because I'm not sure if I was clear. And I, it's important to me that we understand each other. That's a connecting request. Reflect back what you heard me hear, or what you heard me say. The second one is, how is it for you to hear what I'm saying? How is it for you to receive this? Those are connecting requests. Now, again, 
if it comes off as sort of a automatic or robotic question, people aren't going to like it. It's like you're interrogating them or you're following a script. But if it's an authentic question, I'm worried I've said something and I, I so want to be understood. Could you share with me what you're hearing so we can be on the same page moving forward? Or my relationship is really, your relationship with me is important to me. I value you. How, how is it for me to share this with you? Those are the connecting requests. Then there are the practical action oriented requests. And it's an easy way to remember it if you remember the word Plato. Stands for person, location, action, time, and object. I think you all probably have this experience in your personal life and in your work that the more specific a request can be, the easier it is to measure whether it's doable and then look back and see if it was actually completed. When we have vague requests, it's nearly impossible for someone to understand unless they try and read your mind. And I highly, highly discourage mind reading. So who is the request for? Where is the request going to happen? Let's say the, the person is, um, uh, is my housemate. The location is the kitchen. The action is emptying the dishwasher. The time is after she gets home from work, but before it's time to start making dinner. And the object, the dishes. So I may not get everything I'm asking for, but the more specific I am, the more there's room for negotiation to work with requests so that people's needs can be met. It might be that I this time is important for me between getting home from work and when it's time to start dinner because I want to make dinner with a clean kitchen. That's just a preference I have. Okay, so not only is this helpful, and I suggest you write it down as a reminder when you're trying to ask people to do things, it also is really valuable to tell the difference between what is a need and what is a strategy to meet a need? And here's how it works. If you're thinking about something and you believe it's a need, ask yourself this question. Do any of these things apply? If they do, it's not a need. It's a strategy. Needs have a life of their own. They're timeless. They're not related to objects or people or things or places. They live in the universe. They are not temporary, they are permanent. So if I say to someone, hey, you know, I, oh, here's the other clue. If your sentence is, I really need you to, that's a strategy. So an example might be, um, wow, I really, I really need lunch right now. Now this is, a, this is a subtle one, right? Is it a strategy or is it a need? Lunch is a strategy to meet the need for sustenance. Because we need food and water and shelter and clothing to survive. Now I may have a preference for having lunch. I may really want lunch. But is lunch a universal human need? No. Okay. This is, a, this is starting to get into the realm of, wow, I could use more information about the difference between strategies and needs. But here's your pro tip. Just go through and say, gee, does it have any of these qualities to it? If it does, it's a strategy. Then you can take that strategy and figure out what needs are underneath, <coughs> as I just gave an example of. Um, any questions about requests and differences between needs and strategies? Because that was a lot of information all at once. Yes? So I'm curious, what is the need behind, is there a need behind each strategy? Yes. So in the example that you gave, what's the universal need? Behind lunch? Or no, I'm sorry, the one about um, emptying the dishwasher. Oh, well, let's, let's think about this for a minute. Need for order. A need for order. Now, I would say when I have order, let's drop it down even deeper. If I have order, Ease. 
ease. What else? Just connect with what it feels like and what's going on for you when you have order and um, organization. Is that peace and happiness? Peace and happiness, let's say. Control yeah. and security. Now, control's an interesting one. When I have control over something, what is my underlying need? You said it. Security. Security, safety, predictability. We're humans. The more we know about what's going to happen next, the better we feel. Does this make sense? Do you think respect would be part of it in addition? So, because it's not just you keeping order, it's someone else. Yeah, so respect is an interesting one. I would say respect and safety are just two examples of needs that can sometimes fall into the strategy category. So it just sort of depends on how deep you want to go in terms of vulnerable needs. Respect is often a strategy we have to feel valued and cared for and to belong and to matter. Well, it's much more vulnerable to say, I'm feeling left out and I really want to belong. It's I'm lonely than, than to say, well, I need respect. You see that difference in the heartfelt? It's much more vulnerable. Um, the other one you said was safety. Safety can mean a lot of different things to different people. So I'm careful about using that word safety. I want to know what it means to someone else when I use the word safety. Yeah? It leads me also to remind you that there's something in NBC we call faux feelings or false feelings. And those are words that are accusatory in the guise of feelings. Like, I feel manipulated. When I say to someone, I feel manipulated, I might as well point my finger and say, you're manipulating me. Or I feel really disappointed. You disappointed me. Or I'm feeling really abandoned. You abandoned me. Now, I strongly believe that someone can have a feeling of being abandoned and not have it be full of blame and recrimination for someone else. This is more subtle. We can have all kinds of feelings and really trust them if they're not involving blaming someone else or making someone else wrong. Okay? So this is just one of those things where if I'm disappointed, I want to be really careful about, am I disappointed that someone else didn't meet my needs? Or am I just sad and, and, um, and feeling a sense of loss that I wanted something that I didn't get? This is a bit subtle, but this is going slightly deeper in. Yeah? Um, just going back to strategies and needs, yeah. if you talk a little bit about just like a hypothetical example, which is common, say, you know, a relationship with at a workplace like a boss where you, your strategy may be that you want a promotion or to advance. Sure. Um, you know, but you want to be authentic in your relationship building with that individual yeah. and have a mutually respectable. How do you? I love this question because it brings up something really important, and that is when we are in positions where someone has power over us or power under us instead of equal power, things are different. Empathy and honest self-expression are wonderful strategies to build connection and mutuality and understanding but they must be used with discernment. We all know people where if we actually offered ourselves vulnerably to them, we might be hurt or injured emotionally. Or it might not be safe for us actually physically. So to do this without what I would call healthy boundaries is a recipe for difficulty. And this is where discernment comes in. I'm not gonna go to my boss and share every vulnerable feeling I have because that's not a safe environment for me to disclose everything. And I'm using that as an example. I actually really like my boss and would feel comfortable doing that. But as a bigger picture, using discernment around when am I going to share and what I'm going to share is a really valuable tool. Does that answer your question a little bit? Or do you want yeah, something I a little more specific? I, it does. It lets me know that there's sort of a different approach in those contexts. I mean, it's probably hard to get specific without a specific situation, but um, yeah. I guess, is, that, is there any other general things you can say about that dynamic with the boss and the need to, you know, be promoted or the perceived need to... I think my suggestion would be, because of this setting and how much time we have, to go back to the overall 
um, consciousness of nonviolent communication, which is to figure out the observation. What's going on here that I can really measure? What's going on for me emotionally about it? And what are my needs around it? Connecting with that and then figuring out, well, what strategies do I want to use that are authentic and honest with discernment, with some boundaries, and then make some specific requests that are measurable and doable. And of course, if I make a request and I get a no back, I can be curious, well, what's their need behind their no? What might be going on for them? What are their unmet needs about? and then come up with some new strategies that, that might work for them. I love the question. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah. Um, the last page of your packet, which we're not going to get to in terms of demonstration and practice, is how to prepare to have difficult conversations. It's the same process as offering gratitude to have a difficult conversation. For a difficult conversation, we have an observation, we have our feelings, not blameful, but what's going on for us, what our needs are in request. Preparing for a difficult conversation is something I highly recommend before engaging with someone because it's all about taking responsibility for what we can do. Um, Marshall Rosenberg used to say, 99% of nonviolent communication is an inside job. It comes back to us over and over again. What is I, my responsibility? What is it I want? What can I authentically connect with? And if I have blame or wrongness or judgments of other people, then I have some work to do. It's not easy to do. It's simple, but it's incredibly demanding of us to really touch into connecting with other human beings with their fallibility and their errors and their humanity. And sometimes we don't have the energy for it. We have to decide, is this relationship important enough for me to do this? For some, it may not be. But for those we value, it's often worth the effort because it leads to more con connection, leads to more collaboration, more creativity, more closeness, and an increase in humanity. So we have five more minutes. Any questions or comments, I'm happy to ask. And um, if not, we'll, we'll end a little early. I'm going to give you a moment to check in and, and think about it. Yeah, go ahead. I was just wondering about the name, nonviolent yes. communication. Is there any? Um, tell us about that. Sure. So Marshall Rosenberg, who founded NBC, studied Buddhism. He was also a psychologist and worked with Carl Rogers. So there was a lot of humanistic psychology. But in Buddhism, it's, it's, there's a way of talking about things instead of framing things in the positive, like tell the truth, use moderation, um, be peaceful, be compassionate, um, which are tenets of, of Buddhism. Um, <coughs> their approach is to, to stop doing things. Don't lie, um, don't be violent, uh, don't overdo it. When I first learned about this, it rubbed me the wrong way because as a social worker, I've been trained to, to do everything as much as possible in the positive, right? Like if someone's on, if a kid's on a balance beam, you don't say, like, don't fall because the brain hears fall. Instead, you say, well, use good balance. But what I learned, and I really love this, is that in Buddhism there's this idea that you may not really be ready to be compassionate. You may not be ready to stop lying or to, to be truthful all the time. You may not be ready to, um, to be really moderate in your behavior. But you can just stop doing the other thing. Um, and when I framed it that way, it was much more acceptable to me. It feels more feels more accepting and, and human. We're all going to try our best, and sometimes we're not going to be very effective. But if we just stop lying, that might be a start. If we just stop being violent, and by violent, of course, we can be violent in our words and in our thoughts as well as in our actions. 
So sometimes people call it compassionate communication because it lands better with the general public. But I actually, I actually like to call it what it is and have an opportunity to explain the thought behind it, which your question allowed me to do. Thank you. It makes me think that you meet the person where they're at. Yes. Assessing their capacity. Yes. Because sometimes people don't have a capacity to fully maybe receive, like when you were talking about discernment. It's like, well, I know some friends who maybe I could speak some life into them, but they don't really have the capacity right now to receive that. You know, so you would do more of a gentler approach. Thank like you. Meeting them right where they're at. Yeah, I mean, you said in five words what it took me 50 to say. No, no I, I mean, I'm really appreciating it because I'm going to use that in the future. It allows us to meet people where they are. Yeah. I, I love that. Thanks. Yeah. Um, yes? So did you write the, um, that uh, I did. interview? Yeah. I did. And thank you for pointing it out. Part of the benefit of being a facilitator for something like this is I can ask for your attention for 30 seconds about something that doesn't directly have to do with nonviolent communication and yet is at the very heart of it. And that is yesterday on Terry Gross's NPR sh show Fresh Air, Peggy Orenstein was talking about her new book. A while back she wrote a book called Girls and Sex. And it was about how her research shows that girls have lost touch with their physical bodies, their desire, their wants, their needs, um, and how that wreaks havoc and can cause injury. She then wrote a book called Boys and Sex, and she talked about this on Terry's show yesterday. And it was heartbreaking and horrific for me to listen to. And I thought, every person who has a child or works with children, particularly young, young men, every parent, every mentor of young men, I ask that you listen to this and that you share it in any way you can um, because I think it's incredibly powerful. And that our societal norms make victims out of perpetrators and perpetrators out of victims and everyone suffers. It's not as black and white as our culture might want it to be. Her takeaway was that this issue with girls is more about their physical bodies and their disconnect. With boys, it's a disconnect from their hearts and how horrific and terrible it is. So my request is that you find some time and listen to this interview and that you, if, you, if it resonates with you and it's meaningful to you, to find a way to share it. Um, and also... <laughs> You may have noticed that I was drinking out of my Michigan Radio mug this morning. I'm going to give a plug for Michigan Radio, our affiliate uh, NPR station in Ann Arbor. And any way that you can support them, um, I, that would be a request. Okay. Uh, I'll stay after if anyone has questions that they'd like to ask me um, privately. I'll be here. Otherwise, I want to thank you so much for your attention and your engagement, it, it's um, meaningful to me and it really meets a lot of my needs for collaboration and sharing NBC in the world. So, thank you. Thank you.